Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Adya Shanti, Adya for short. And um, Adya is pretty well known in the spiritual hierarchy or, or universe of, of teachers these days. Um, and you'll get to know him better if you don't know him already in the course of this interview. And I'll say from the outset that, Adya, I'm not going to hit you with a lot of biographical questions. Um, oh, thank you, Rick. Yeah. Um, you did a great interview about a month ago with um, Renata McNay over in London and, and Conscious TV. And uh, that went into great detail on your biography. And I'm going to actually link to that from our website so people can uh, listen to it if they haven't already. And if I do ask you any biographical questions, they'll be more subjective in nature rather than about events in your life. Um, so, now, in preparing for these interviews, I, I listen to people that I'm going to interview for about a week uh, beforehand, just, uh, you know, maybe four or five hours altogether over the course of a week. And uh, I've listened to you probably an entire week if you 24 hours a day over several years because I really enjoy listening to you and the funny thing is when I have listened to someone for a week I can usually summarize pretty well what it is they say um, mm -hmm. and in your case the funny thing is I can't do that very well it's like as I'm listening every single sentence kind of resonates with me on a deep level and it feels enlivening and um, you know, con com confirming of my own experience and um, just generally uh, very enjoyable to listen to. But it, when people ask me, well, what does Aja teach? I think I say, well, I don't know, actually. He's just really clear. <laughs> and I really enjoy listening to him. Uh, so perhaps for the benefit of um, those who aren't familiar with you, maybe you could give the, uh, the bus stop... Um, <laughs> the bus stop rap on, on what what it is you'd like to say in a nutshell well I that's you know that's a hard question for me too because it's, uh -huh. it's not really something I reflect on a lot um, I think what your experience is not unusual in the sense of I don't even think of myself as having like a, a, a set kind of teaching there are many themes that come up in, in the teaching and um, I mean, in the broadest possible sense, the, what the teachings focused on is, I guess you could say, spiritual awakening and also um, what happens after a spiritual awakening, that whole vast terrain of what unfolds after that. Um, as far as the more specifics of it, it's very individual. For Often it's whoever I'm talking to, what the audience I'm talking to, of, of what I will give them to, to aid them. I, I think the spirit of inquiry underlies all the teaching, spirit of, of questioning, you know, of, of a yeah. deep, deep questioning. And it's not just the questioning of, you know, who am I or what am I? That's, that's part of it too. But it's, a, it's the un, an underlying questioning where we really look at all of the, the, the entire belief structure that we have, whether it's about ourselves or others of the world or um, the belief structures that they are the things that tend to limit and confine the consciousness. So the spirit of inquiry is a really important part of the teaching. So do you kind of respond to individuals or audiences according to what they ask you or is it more on an intuitive level where you just sort of kind of tune into them and the right thing comes out of your mouth? It's really more of an intuitive thing. Like mm -hmm. when I when I uh, speak at a meeting, I'll often speak for half hour, sometimes an hour, and that's before I've talked to anybody or get a read on where they're at. So sometimes it's just sort of what I'm inspired to talk about, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and even when you're doing that, there's still a an, an unspoken relationship between the audience who came energetically, and I can see, sense what resonates for them, what mm -hmm. what seems to be important and course when I talk to individuals I'm always interested in okay what's what's the next step for this person yeah what's the next step they need to see mm -hmm. you know some people will tell you what that is they'll they'll really be they'll have their direction they'll know exactly what the, the direction they want to go in many people they really they don't know the direction they really want to go in you know they don't they don't know what the next step is so that's part of 
helping them clarify what that is. Mm. Very important. Well, another thing I noted that you just reminded me of when I um, listened to you is that I'm, I'm really rather astounded by the fact that you can go on for an hour without really repeating yourself and you know and i can listen to hour after hour in different talks and you're not just beating the same point to death you, it's like there's always a fresh presentation uh and new points and new ideas and all sorts of different things it really seems to be coming unless you have little teleprompters in your glasses it really seems to be coming from a a kind of a an intuitive wellspring of of knowledge yeah i i i really never prepare for any of the talks i give or any of the teachings i give so they're all, always extemporaneous, spontaneous at the moment. And, you know, I'm, I'm somebody that I get very, very bored with hearing even myself say the same thing in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I can say, you know, you can say the same thing in a hundred different ways, 200 different ways. Yeah. And for the, peop the people who are listening, you may be saying the same thing, but if you put it in just a particular way, it resonates for them. For somebody else, they need to hear it just a little bit different. So if there's, a, if there's sort of any intention, it's, the intention is, is to not use the same words um, all the time, to really, to really keep it fresh, yeah. you know, keep it fresh and keep it sort of on, on the edge too. Do you ever find yourself getting into a groove where you feel like, you know, this is getting a little old here, I, I keep saying this thing? <laughs> sure. Uh -huh. If I if I li if I find myself speaking even t to me it sounds like even something I did a week ago mm -hmm. already I'm thinking it feels it's not as vital mm -hmm. and to me the most important part of 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 when I'm speaking is to me it's more important to have that feeling of fresh inspiration that's more important to me than simply the content of the teaching because I think it's, it's inspiration that human beings, we all connect in an intuitive way really deeply with anything that someone's doing from a standpoint of inspiration. It could be anything, but it somehow really connects and it communicates. It opens a line of energetic communion that, um, that's not there if it's just you know, repeating the teaching. Well, I think that's what I was alluding to earlier when I said that I can listen to you for hours and hours, and, and I, it's not like I come away with some zingy little bits of content that I can regurgitate for someone, but it's more like there's a sort of an inspirational um, affinity or resonance or something that I find enlivening on a very deep level. I'm glad it works that way for you. Um, and it, But it also comes from my perception of truth. And I find that, that the deeper one's realization goes, the more paradoxical it becomes. Mm. It becomes something that, that often holds what into our minds are totally of view, opposing viewpoints. In deep experience, totally opposing viewpoints can be held effortlessly, mm -hmm. easily. Um, and since that, since that's, I think the deeper you go, that becomes more and more, it stands out. The, the, the view gets vaster and vaster and it contains more and more and more what seems like opposite. You know, like, what are you? You know, something or nothing. <laughs> and, and depending on, you know, where you're stuck, um, oftentimes the nothingness is, is, or the formlessness is emphasized. But if you're stuck in the formlessness, then you got to see that Everything, all the forms, are a manifestation of the formless. See, those are two seem two totally opposite things, right? The formless yeah. of the form. Which one is it? And so, I think that's one of the reasons that, um, as a as a teacher, I I kind of try to speak of what's relevant to when I'm talking to one person. I'm only talking to that one person. Right. When I'm talking in general. I tend to paint a, with a with a bigger paintbrush. You might think I I, I paint. I don't. I'm not concerned with the next step for a particular person. So often, the teaching kind of comes out much more paradoxical. Mm -hmm. You know, because life itself is very paradoxical, isn't it? It is. I love that word. I should have a T-shirt made with paradox on the front, and I think I'd put ambiguity on the back. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's another good one. <laughs> that's a wonderful one. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, yeah. uh, someone quoted Nisargadatta as having said that uh, paradox and am the ability to appreciate paradox and ambiguity are good measures of the degree to, of one's spiritual maturity. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I would absolutely mm -hmm. agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's one of the tricks of any spiritual teaching that someone engages with is there's certain elements, hopefully for, for the person, they'll really resonate. You know, it'll be what they need to hear at just that time, and it, it might spark insights or, or some revelation. And then the tendency of the mind is if something really sparked revelation or insight, the mind tends to hold on to it mm. and wants to hold on to that which sparked the insight. You know, that's what kind of caused, the, in a certain sense, had a causal relationship with the revelation. That's a natural tendency of mind. It wants to sort of concretize, right? Yeah. And, and that's a really, really subtle, subtle thing that for, I think, a lot of people, it's hard to, um, it becomes hard for them to let go because you're often, the farther you go, you're letting go of your attachment to things and ideas and concepts that may have really worked for you spiritually, mm. may have been really important for you. And then later, to get a vaster view, you have to sort of let go of any clinging to them. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I was listening to a talk, I think, yesterday in which you were saying that um, your definition of enlightenment was not believing one's thoughts, <laughs> um, which sort of pertains to what you're saying. Just, um, mm -hmm. you know, and people do have a tendency to take their thoughts very seriously, don't they? Absolutely. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's, it's easy, for some people it can be easy to say, see where somebody else is grasping their thoughts. You know, some other form of religious fundamentalism, let's say. Right. You know, someone looks at the preacher that's on at 2 o'clock in the morning and they're asking for all your money, you know. They, <laughs> and you say, oh, that, that's a fundamentalist. But it's really, it's, it's more delicate to, to really realize that we can turn anything into a fundamentalist doctrine, in, including non-dual teaching. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, non non dual teachings are some of the easiest to turn into a sort of fundamentalism because they have a they have a very precise logic to them. And so they really appeal to the mind, which is good that they have a precise logic, but it's not so good in the sense that it becomes very easy to um you know, become a non dual fundamentalist. I've run into a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In this it's, in this interviewing business, you know. I bet you it's, very, <laughs> it's a very hard thing to break somebody out of, too. Yeah. You know, cuz it's very well defended. It is, and I I don't really feel qualified to break them out of it, but um, you know, I I do sort of tackle them and and try to I mean, I was going to bring that up later, but since you brought it up, um, I'd like to run through a few of those points that the the sort of the non-dual so-called fundamentalists tend to um, emphasize. Um, well, for one thing, you know, a lot of them just say, uh, you know, well, perhaps I could ask you this before I itemize some of these things. Um, it seems to me that, that the mistake that's most often made in that arena is that a, uh, a description of the experience the person is having or the perspective from which they are living is offered as a prescription for everybody else and everybody else yes. is not necessarily at that level of experience right mm -hmm. would you would you agree with that i would agree yeah. <coughs> yeah and so you know statements come out like quit seeking mm -hmm. you know which obviously that person has done but to me that's like the mountain climber on the peak shouting down to everybody quit climbing you know yeah right <laughs> whereas for like them it's that. appropriate you know yeah, and it's also, it's, it's, it's not just to say, it might be appropriate, say, if you've already got to the top of the mountain, right? Yeah. So, and you're yelling back, you don't need to climb anymore to somebody else. But it's also, it's, I think it gets to a subtler point about any spiritual teaching is, I tell people that all spiritual teachings, at the very best of them, are their, their, their strategies for awakening. Mm -hmm. They're strategies. That's mm -hmm. what they are. And they're not the truth, because you can't put the truth into words. And a lot of people say that, and then the next thing they do is believe the words they're utilizing, you know. But if you see it in strategies, 
then let's say for somebody they've been seeking and seeking and seeking for 20 or 30 years, right? They've become a, like a contracted ball of, of seeking. <laughs> and for that person, if, at just the right time, if you can say, let go of all, drop all seeking now. Right. For that person, it can have a tremendous impact. And then they, the seeking drops spontaneously, and oh, then they have they can see what was always there, but they couldn't see it because they were so wrapped up in the seeking. Now somebody else that's sitting on their couch, cracking a beer, surfing the <laughs> internet through non-dual websites, and someone's saying you don't have to seek. Well, you know, and you just c grab over and get another beer out of your six-pack. You know, that's pretty much what I wanted to hear anyway. Yeah. That's not that's not the right strategy for that person. It's not right. necessarily what they need to hear. Who knows what they need to hear? They it may or it may not be that they need to seek. But you know, they're like I say, it's it's like a it, teachings are medicine for d different states of diseasement, right? And it'd be you know if you gave the same if you gave antibiotics to every person who came to you as a doctor for every disease, it would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would just be silly. But that's sometimes what happens in spirituality. It would yeah. also be silly to say that because you maybe got cured from something by the use of antibiotics, that you think that the antibiotic itself is, is health. Right. You know, it's like mistaking the teaching for the truth. Mm -hmm. No where it helped you return to was health. The teaching might have helped you return to the truth, but it's not in the, um, you know, it's not in the, it's not in the strategy, it's not in the medicine. There's that popular Indian saying, it takes a thorn to remove a thorn. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, oh, and, and uh, of course there are also boat analogies about, you know, going across the river in a boat, and when you get to the other side, it may be appropriate to get out of the boat, but getting out of the boat is not necessarily the best instruction when you're halfway across the river. <laughs> That's, right. That's a good point. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's always, it just depends on the person themselves, doesn't it? Yeah. What does that person need to hear? You know, to think they all, they need to hear one spiritual teaching is, you know, it's naive at best and it can be destructive at worst. Yeah, and hearkening back to the the paradox point, um, you know, in my own case, you know, I feel like it, simultaneously I'm not seeking, you know, mm -hmm. I'm very very content resting in you know presence, but at the same time, you know, I I'm seeking like a son of a gun in terms of my fascination with this stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I just love it. I love reading about it, talking to people, uh, all yeah. that, and um, so, but it, it's not like it used to be. You know, yeah. twenty like thirty. You're not, you're not yeah. driven like you were. Yeah, and I don't feel this sort of desperate yearning and longing, like, oh, God, when is it going to happen for me? You know, it's like, eh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that can be the common mistake I hear with quite a few folks is is that um, sometimes even for when them, through their own realization, the, the that kind of seeking, that ardent striving for something that uh, isn't, isn't, they haven't found, when that falls away, there can be this sort of misunderstanding that okay, it fall, it fa it's fallen away. Therefore, that means I've arrived, mm -hmm. and that's it. There's absolutely nothing more to see. Right. You know? And actually, okay, yeah. There's, in one sense, if we really see the truth, if we really perceive it, in one sense, there's not more of it because there's not more or less of truth. But simultaneously, that one truth has an infinite depth. Yeah. Right. And so that infinite debt, we, there's an infinite capacity for it to reveal itself, even though it's the same one truth. And I think there's often a lot of confusion about that, that the seeking can disappear, but if the devotion or the love affair with truth disappears, then, you know, um, then we usually have gotten stuck somewhere. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a point I bring up in almost every single interview, usually towards the end, you know, I, I say to the person, well... You know, do you feel like there's more that can be unfolded or more that can be gained? And, and, and a large, well, at least half of them say no. You know, mm -hmm. they say, well, this is it. I can't see any possibility of further 
mm -hmm. refinement or development or anything else. Others, you know, they have more of an attitude like you just stated, and and they acknowledge that there could probably be no end to the refinement of the heart, of the perception, of the, you know, emotions, all, all sorts of things have... The human capacity to express what you realize. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because people can have really quite profound insights, but when it comes to their ability to express them as a human being, they can just constantly be reverting back to their whole condition sent conditioning. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you can't, there's another paradox, isn't it? Is you bump when you really bump into the truth, there's not more of it. You know, there's not something behind it. There's not something different than it. But, and you can then you can make certain conclusions based on that. Yeah. And that's but that that's really and that's easy to understand because there's no paradox in it. There's no there's no confusion in it. But when you really start to open up, then you realize there is a paradox that there's not more or less truth, but there is an infinite capacity for truth to reveal itself. And it will right up until you decide that there's nothing else for you to see. Hmm. If you've you, decide, if you've decided that, and that's oh, what if you you've believe, decided, yeah, right, then very often that'll be it. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, intention it can be quite powerful. Very powerful, uh, which, yeah. which then will be self-fulfilling, right? Because you don't see anything more or deeper, you assume there isn't anything more or deeper to. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm. Some would say that's the value of having a teacher or, you know, the value of knowledge. It sort of doesn't enable you to kind of rest on your laurels, uh, you know. There's the, like I think you said when you had your first awakening, there was as if some voice that came to you that said, this isn't the end of it, keep going. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't as if it said something. It did say something. It did say that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and as my own teacher used to say, she'd say, well, you know, awake, awakening means that we've now made a start. Right. You've started now. When you've awakened, now we can really start. Mm. And which was, you know, when I heard that so many years ago, it was quite honestly quite disappointing, you know, because I'm waiting for some great event, which will be the end, and I can be done with all this, you know, terrible drive for enlightenment and all that. And she was, and she would say, well, yeah, but also remember that when you awaken, it means we've just started. And it took me years to realize what she meant was actually true. Not that you've just started in the sense that there's going to be more to seek and strive for, and not not in that sense, but in the sense of, you know, awakening is the end of something. It's the end of that desperation, isn't it? Mm. The end of that feeling like you have to find more or different or better. So it, it is a very definite end when it's authentic, but it also opens up other doors that are just beginning to open. And those doors are, those that's infinite capacity. Yeah, I'd like to probe into some of those doors with you a little bit more, but um, let's, let's define awakening a little bit because everybody throws that term around, you know? Yeah. And it, it kind of reminds me of the Eskimos with their 32 names for snow, you know? And I really wonder if everyone's referring to the same thing. They're not. They, I don't think <laughs> so. Not. So, no. so how would you define it, define that term in a nutshell? Wow, you know, even for me, it's really hard hard to do um, because from what I've seen, awakening can happen on many different levels, mm -hmm. and it can be more or less complete. Um, and so, what I mean by that is, what awakening, the common thread of it no matter how deep it is or shallow it is, the common thread, the difference, let's say, between a spiritual awakening and a spiritual experience is that a, an awakening always involves some fundamental shift in your, in your sense and view of self, of yourself, yeah. who, who you take yourself to be. It, if there's awakening, you, that fundamental sense of who you are shifts, right? And, and, it, and so that's, that's a real. That's like the groundwork for the difference between, say, a spiritual. You can have all sorts of spiritual experiences. Some very powerful. They can even be quite transformative, and quite amazing. But the difference between the spiritual experience and awakening is the awakening does have, as its, as its effect, a fundamental shift in identity. Now that fundamental shift, where it shifts to, that's where 
it can maybe say for instance for people it's really common to their sense of self is very much limited to their ego and their ideas and their beliefs and all of that about themselves even if they have spiritual beliefs otherwise you know but they emotionally and psychologically they're identified on ego level they have spiritual awakening and all of a sudden that identification spontaneously leaves that and goes to let's say very common people then go okay now my new identity is awareness I'm pure awareness and that's not just a thought or a concept it's like the lived experience right mm -hmm. almost like the, your locus of look, where you are and what you are shifts but that in itself so it's gone to, and that's a huge transformation it's a it's a big shift right life will not be the same after that as it was before but that just what I just mentioned that's not the end of the line of awakening by any means that's not even full awakening it's it is awakening as I would define it but it's not the whole picture because it's still it's still dualistic in the sense that often you have the sense of you being awareness maybe without location but then you have the whole world of form hmm. and what's all that yeah what's because a lot of times it, at that point like I tell people okay now you got the world down to a nice manageable duality you've got you as as awareness or consciousness and everything else right that's a nice manageable now, now there's only two things in all of existence where there used to be billions you know um, but still there's a duality that needs to be seen through needs to be penetrated because in tr in reality there isn't that duality so and that's it's funny it's fun oh, I'm sorry go ahead I'm done Oh, I was going to say it's funny because people have that initial awakening, awakening you're talking about, and then they say this is non-duality, you mm -hmm. know? Right. But like you just said, it's often it's, a it's a radical duality. Yeah. It's gone from garden variety duality to sort of duality pushed to its to its zenith, right? Yeah. The, the nothing and the something. Now, for some people, they might go right beyond that, and they'll actually see that the nothing and the something are actually the same. They're actually two aspects of the same, the same truth, right? the same being. And I mean, that's just the something and nothing, right? That's just form and formlessness. That's not all that happens in spiritual awakening too. Hmm. There's, there's, it can have much, it can go much, much deeper than that as well. So there's lots of levels and you're very right. Different people do mean, it's like saying the word ego. Yeah, and you just assume that everyone's talking about the same thing. I asked a friend of mine about six months ago, who's a psychologist, has been a psychologist for about forty years. I was writing something, and I was writing the word ego, and I thought, hmm, it occurred to me. I don't think we there's any consensus. So I I, I wonder, I wonder what, in, in psychology if there's a consensus. So I asked him. I said, so in psychological work what's the definition of ego? And he said, which one do you want? I can think of 10 right off the top of my head. <laughs> right? yeah. And this is somebody who got a doctorate in psychology from Stanford some 40 years ago. So often when we use these terms, you're very right that we're not talking about the same thing and it's always important to define exactly what we mean by the words we use. It is, otherwise, I mean, you're, you're saying one thing and everybody's hearing something else. Right, or like you said, they just lump it all together. And right. Then it's, I've been looking for 15 years for a different word than awakening. Hmm. I just haven't come up with one. I would love to come up with something different just because, you know, once people use the word too much and it means too many different things, then it almost loses all of its meaning. Yeah. You know, well, you know, like the Eskimos with all their names for snow, the Indians, you know, since they specialized in this for thousands of years, they have all their different types of samadhi and all kinds of gradations yeah. and flavors and yeah. whatnot that they have actual words for, and presumably yeah. they can communicate with each other about them. Right. But here in the West, we, we kind of <laughs> we're kind of more simple about it, I guess. Well, I think we we've, we've there's a in, a in a certain segment of the spiritual population has been drawn to to that simplicity. The reason some of the non-dual teachings have caught on, I think, is because there's a there's a there's a certain type of non-dual teaching that it can be pointed to and delivered in a very simple way. And the, what what it's done for a lot of people is that have come from very more complex spiritual backgrounds is they get lost in that complexity yeah they you know there's so much there it's 
It's like what happens when you have 30 genera or 50 or 100 generation of monks sitting around all day gazing at their navel. Well, they tend to start slicing the pie of oneness into ever more subtle and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller bits. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but from the seeker's perspective, it's easy to lose yourself. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why right now, which this is just right now, things will change, but right now, sort of almost like a radical, non-dual teaching resonates with so many people it's because a lot of people have been lost in that mm. and they it's like they suddenly come out of this fog of concepts and it can be really useful for them however there is a there's the other side of it that things can get so simplified that they almost get kind of dummied down yeah and the the subtlety and the true richness of the potential of human realization that one what one realizes can get can get lost you know in these broad simple concepts hmm. perhaps the right way to go about it is to uh, just avoid being a fundamentalist like we were saying earlier I mean find the level of complexity that that works for you but don't insist that that's the, the way it has to be for everybody sure well isn't that that that's the birth that's fundamentalism right it, what, yeah. what worked for me it's it's the only thing that can work for everybody else Right. And, it's, and it's the only truth. <laughs> and it, it, it gets even a little bit more potentially confusing because, you know, when we, when we realize a certain aspect, or I think of it as a facet of truth, um, I, I think of it like enlightenment or reality as, it, it, it metaphorically as a diamond. It's, I'm not the first one to look at it this way. It's sort of historically been viewed this way. And each facet is a particular viewpoint on that truth. So let's take the viewpoint of the facet of no self. Mm -hmm. When there's a realization that there is no separate self, that's a particular facet. The, the difficulty can become with each facet of that jewel, that diamond of, of enlightenment, each facet, because it is reality. It feels like reality, and any time you, you touch upon reality, it feels completely complete. Mm. absolutely complete it feels like nothing left out you can't touch upon reality without it feeling like that yeah the difficulty is the confusion is because each facet of that diamond feels like that that you can mistake the facet for the whole of the jewel hmm. right. it's very easy to do unless there's somebody to go oh wait a minute no that's not it's it's a facet it's very profound but you're mistaking a facet for the whole jewel yeah. And that's really, really common, again, because each facet feels like the whole jewel. That's a good point. You know, it reminds me of the hologram. You can take a slice of a hologram and shine a laser through it, and you get the same image that you'd get if you t had the entire hologram. But <clears throat> with the entire hologram, you get a lot more detail and a lot more yeah. sort of perfection of the image. Yeah, yeah, just that's a great example. Huh. Just like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it makes it more complex when you're when you're a teacher. You know, it's 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 easy if you kind of have one message and one thing, and you just can keep hammering home on that over and over and over and over and over and over. And for some people, that might be fine. That might work for them. You know, um, but if you're someone like like I am, which which I have a great appreciation not only for the simple but also for the very subtle, mm -hmm. and 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 with depth. Then, you know, like you said, you, you listen to a week of my teaching and it's hard to like extract, you know, the, um, the message. Yeah. You know, the, the, the one message that it's all about. And that's because it's not about one message. Huh. Good. So I pass. <laughs> <laughs> I, I found. I, I didn't people, flunk. <laughs> no, you can't flunk. I find that people just resonate, you know, I always tell people, just pay attention to what resonates for you because that's what's important for you now. Yeah. Don't worry about the rest. Don't confuse yourself about the rest. Just If it resonates, if you feel that, that thing in you that goes, oh, yes, oh, yes, I didn't know that I knew that, but somehow I understand it or I'm starting to understand it, that's what's important for that person at that moment. Mm. You know, the rest, you know, leave it till it's relevant. We were talking about ego a few minutes ago. Um, so, did you ever come up with a definition of ego that you're you're comfortable with? 
Well, my, my, probably the one I use the most is just the resistance to what is. Uh-huh. E- ego is a, is, is, it's, ego has a quality of resistance. Right. At its base, when you get down to sort of the root of it, which is in your, in the gut, the sense of self, it's literally just like a closed fist hmm. in your gut. It's just like it's energetic no to life. And then it comes up into the heart, the energy is in the heart, and then there it's sort of an emotional, feeling-based protectionism and fear. And then, of course, in the mind, then that same, what start out as just a re- reflex in the gut of no, of just a contraction, becomes the whole, one's whole psychology, which is often, it's, it's, a, it's a pushing away and or a grasping. So I always see, you know, ego is the thing that's always negotiating with life. So is that what the ego does, or is that what the ego is? Or it's both. Both. Okay. Because to me, ego is a verb. It's a huh. movement. It's a happening, right? Huh. So in, in other words, people can notice this if they just sort of bring attention to it. There are times when you just stop thinking about yourself in any given day. Right. You just don't remember yourself. You're not sitting there telling yourself your name. You're not fantasizing about where you'll be in the next minute, or you're not arguing with, you know, the your coworker in your mind when you're at home. With these gaps, for a lot of people, unfortunately, they're very small. But when their whole thought process is no longer about themselves, and at those moments, there there isn't there is no ego mm-hmm. at that moment. Now. <clears throat> They will probably go into a relationship with the world or another person, and it will immediately come back as a reflex. But to me, an ego is a it's it's not a it's not a noun. It's not something that's sort of that's stable. It's a it's a verb. So, using yourself as a case in point, um, presumably you you're very sort of deeply accustomed to not trying to manipulate and not trying to force things to be this way or that or not trying to resist and um, and yet pres- also presumably and correct me if I'm wrong um, there's there's some sense of self I mean if if this always puzzles me if somebody comes mm-hmm. into a room and says hey Adya you turn your head you know Terry doesn't turn her right. head uh, so right. and if Terry stubs her toe Terry's your assistant I'm referring to Terry if Terry stubs her toe Terry feels the pain you don't feel <laughs> the pain that Terry's right. feeling so this fortunately and, yeah yeah <laughs> so I hope she doesn't do that too often so there's there's still this sort of like individuation at least by for all appearances and mm-hmm. yet it, and yet I hear people saying there's absolutely no one home uh, stubbing the toe is happening, but there's no one whose toe has actually been stubbed. You know, there's no one whose yeah. head is actually turning, and all that. So, please yeah, elaborate yeah. on that. Well, well, I, I can't, I can't necessarily elaborate in the way somebody else puts it, but I can. Elaborate uh, the way you the would problem. put it, yeah. Yeah, because I think the problem again, this becomes a, dif- a, a difficulty because we're you, you get into uh, realms of experience that are that are very, very, very subtle, very subtle. And I don't mean subtle in the sense of not obvious, but they're very, very hard to really conceptualize. Hmm. Um, so let's get back to the first thing you mentioned, which is self, right? Okay. So you're right. Self, there is uh, to, to, to operate, right, in, is in, the, in the world of time and space. There has to be some element of self, if only enough to when someone calls your name, your head turns around, right? Right. I, the way I like to describe it is self is sort of like a perfume mm-hmm. um, that your 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 hum, humanity your humanness is just has this perfume of self in it and it's functional it becomes operational when you can get into states of meditative absorption where this even the most subtle sense of self is completely obliterated and if that's ever happened to you, you realize that you become completely and absolutely totally dysfunctional. <laughs> you can't, you cannot function. Right. You, you, you can feel hunger, but you won't, won't you literally won't know where to put the food. Mm. I've, I've, I've experienced it. I've seen it in people that have been sitting at a retreat and they're in a cafeteria and they got food in front of them and they'll tell me this later and they're, hun- they're they felt hunger, but they couldn't figure out who, who, where to put the food. 
Wow. Because the sense of self was still temporarily obliterated. Well, there have been saints like that who are like that a lot of the time. Ananda Maima and Neem Karoli Baba. I mean, they had to be pretty much taken care of because they were just so out there. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you can get in a place where that, that level of self becomes is totally gone. But then you're not really very functional in, in, a, in a normal, you know, human way, you'd say. You know, if you don't have devotees to put food in your mouth, you're not going to last very long. Um, now, that's a very subtle, 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 subtle sense of self. I mean, that's, that is, you know, one ten thousandth of the amount of self to, to recognize when somebody calls your name or to, you know, know where to put food when you're hungry. Right. That's a fraction of the self that most people go around experiencing and feeling. Yeah. Right? So there's, so the sense of self is, is it is that sense of self, which is what the ego conglomerates around, builds itself around, right? Energetically, it builds itself around that. So there can be the experience of no ego. Ego, ego can, can disappear, depending on how you define ego. There can be the, ex and then there can also be the experience of no, no self, but in the no self would be not that the entire sense of self disappears it would be more like the um, to reflect if you tried to reflect upon yourself that you just couldn't come up with there would be nothing to reflect upon that would be no self ego would be when ego tries to reflect upon itself and it can't find ego none of those neither one of those means that there's not a personality still there. Neither one means that there's not various types of conditioning, both biological and cultural. You know, Indian saints tend to act like Indian saints. They don't <laughs> tend to act like, you know, um, African saints or, you know, or Native American Indian saints. I mean, so they, clearly there's a cultural type of conditioning that's still, that's still present and it's still and it's still operational, um, but again, it's it becomes a very subtle, subtle area. So, would it be fair to say that for the enlightened person who is well established and has worked out a lot of the post awakening stuff that may have to have been worked out, that um, <clears throat> through in their daily functioning enough sort of ego or sense of self is spontaneously and naturally assembled to make that functioning possible and efficient and beyond that there's nothing more unnecessary added it's just sort of like the yeah the essential that, of my, yeah that's probably the closest that i would i could put just speaking from my own experience mm -hmm. is i think it's it's harder to say what is there than what isn't you know, cause one just starts to notice certain things. Um, like, I think we only understand something really deeply and fully when it falls away from us to good measure. Because mm. then we notice its absence. Right. Then we can define what's fallen away. Now we know what's fallen away because it's no longer there. Mm. And so there's lots of types of, you know, reactivity. There's, um, I could just... You know, I could talk on and on about certain things that w used to be there and then aren't there at a certain point. It's, mm. it's, so it's not the sense of what shows up, but the sense of what disappears. Actually, I think it's beyond, beyond the, 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 the first opening of awakening, one's whole spiritual development, if I may use that word in non-dual circles. <laughs> one's okay with me. <laughs> good, okay. One spiritual development is much more, from that point on, defined by what disappears than what appears. Hmm. It, it's defined more by what falls away than even by what is realized. So stuff it, keeps falling away. Steve, stuff keeps falling away. Right, right. Now, it would be up to someone's personal interpretation or description of ego to say, has all of their ego fallen away? Well, depends on how you define it. Hmm. You know, so I mean, I wouldn't go to say to somebody, "Oh, all my ego is falling away." Number one, because I wouldn't have any idea what they meant by it. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and number number two, why would we ever say that to somebody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
because <laughs> you're, unless it had you impressed them. Yeah, right. right. In which case, it, <laughs> it hadn't. Right. It's like that old uh, that old uh, joke about a party for only enlightened people, and you know anybody who showed up would be automatically disqualified from enlightenment <laughs> you know, because you showed up. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> Um, so in hearing you talk, you know, and, and read your book, reading your books and all, I, I've heard you refer to two major kind of milestones. There was the awakening when I think you were about 25 or something, and yeah. then there was one when you were about 32 or so. Um, in, in light of what we've been talking about for the last half hour or so, um, you know, ego and things falling away and all these points we've been considering, um, how would you define those two awakenings? You know, what fell away with the first one, and then what was yeah. it about the second one with it, that was so different from the first one? Well, the first one, that two, two things stood out the most that fell away was seeking, because uh -huh. I was a tremendous seeker. I mean, yeah, just, you were I, intense. I mean, you would I, go from four in the morning till midnight meditating sometimes. Yeah, I was like an Olympic <laughs> champion of seeking. If they could have handed out gold medals, I might have got me one. <laughs> <laughs> so, but after after that sort of experience at 25 the seeking just fell away this, and it never came back it, it just would it just seemed completely ridiculous to seek for what i knew i already was right so it just wouldn't it just never came back and the other thing which is not felt, to say you lost interest in this stuff oh no and, no not and, at all or, or even maybe no. that you stopped meditating or stopped you know, going to sat songs or whatever but that sense of desperation probably yeah. fell away. i didn't yeah. i didn't stop anything Right. I kept meditating. In fact, that's the first time that voice said, "This isn't all of it. Keep going." Right. But I then, from that point on, I was I didn't keep going. In other words, I didn't keep meditating or do whatever I was doing spiritually in order to attain more. Uh -huh. The attainer wasn't there. Right. It's and it's very hard to to tell someone what's that what that is like until they've experienced it. That just because there's no seeking just doesn't mean that all the interest disappears. Mm. You know, or whatever. So that fell away, and the other thing that fell away was fear. Uh -huh. I, all of a sudden, I had no right. fear at all, just none, which was, you know, kind of, it's a little dangerous to take all the fear out of a 25-year-old male. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It does have certain wise limitating, you know, wise limitating factor to it. Um, well, if, if someone had taken you know, hung, you, hung you from the Golden Gate Bridge by your ankles at that point, do you think you would have felt fear? Oh, I don't know. I'm glad I didn't have to figure that out. Right. You know, it, it wasn't necessarily like no fear, like, you know, if, uh, if I stepped in front of a bus and they honked their horn and I had to pull myself back that I wouldn't feel an adrenaline dump, you know. Right, right. Um, that's a very biological kind of fear, mm -hmm. right? It was, it, but it was all, all psychological fear, all mm. fear based on psychology, like, like anything or anyone ever could harm me psychologically, emotionally, in any way whatsoever. Did just, you have to go through a sort of a sound no barrier in which you felt a great deal of fear before you got to the other side of it, or it just dropped away? Because a lot of people do that. They go yeah. through this huge fear thing, you know? Uh, you know, I, I, I did. It was all, that was part of that ex opening of that experience. I, I wasn't fear, at least obvious fear, like we think of fear, um, wasn't very much part of my experience mm -hmm. during my whole life. You know, fear wasn't a big issue. Was fear in other forms probably was you know anxiety that's a type of fear and little, there's lots of ways fear can manifest but as obvious overt fear wasn't a big thing for me but in this particular opening I had at 25 the first when I had this sort of kundalini explosion in my body and I didn't just think I knew with a sort of absolute certainty that this was going to kill me um, if I didn't find some way to stop it and for whatever reason, I couldn't even tell you, but spontaneously something inside me I literally said to myself, if that's what it takes to find out what truth is, okay, I'll die now. Huh. And that wasn't courage, you know, it wasn't macho, it was just like, it was just like a fact. And I was as surprised to hear it in my own mind as anybody else would have been. But as soon as that b voice or whatever it was, it said, okay, let's die now. All of a sudden, you know, Everything changed. Hmm. Everything. I mean, I, I I won't go into great description because I you know I'm not a great fan of you know great detailed spiritual awakening experiences, right, but yeah. a tremendous amount shifted like snapping your fingers. Hmm. And so, 
from that point on, you know, there was no sort of psychological or emotional based fear. It just never, it never came back. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean I was, you know, I was far from some saint. I still had a lot of e um, emotional, ego, and spiritual issues to be, to be, to be worked through. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I worked through, I, I kind of went into hyper, hyper rocket mode of working through karma really quickly. The next five years were not a five years I would wor wish on my worst enemy. Hmm. They were the, probably the hardest five years of my life was came after <laughs> that. Yeah. Um, and yet I got what I asked for because I hmm. wanted I wanted real the whole of truth and I didn't care, especially after that, I didn't care what I had to go through. Hmm. I really didn't care. I didn't care if I was burned in the pits of hell to find the truth or if I could have a life of you know luxury. It didn't matter anymore. Um, and I got what I I got what I needed, you know, just lots of really up and down life situations. You said that when you um, had that second awakening at 32, that you know at that point, you know, every you began to see that you were everything. You you walked around the house, you looked at the toilet, and <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. that's that's me too. Um, yeah. And in light of what we were talking about earlier, how one can have a sort of a non-dual realization, but then the whole world is separate from that, and then later on one can realize, you know, oh, it's all one one reality. Would mm -hmm. would those two uh, phases characterize those two awakenings, or not, not so much? Necessar not necessarily. The, fir the first one was, I just realized, I literally, you know, when I... I would, it happened when I was meditating before I even got into any kind of meditation I literally just sat down and boom mm -hmm. and then when I got up and I bowed to the meditation statue I started laughing and I, and I literally said out loud to my meditation statue I just said you son of a bitch I chased you for all <laughs> these years and here I find out that you are what I am and ah. it was like hilarious um you know, and I wasn't angry, but it was a kind of anger that's funny. Yeah. You know, I just couldn't, couldn't, it was just funny. But, what, but, so I knew that I was that which is eternal and, and cannot be, cannot be born, cannot die, cannot be hurt, cannot be harmed. But when I went outside, I saw that same thing everywhere I looked. So there wasn't that separation. I saw everywhere I looked it was like I could see some hidden little secret in in everything, every blade of grass, every everything. But I the question that I had was even when I saw it, I wasn't clear on what it was. Hmm. Not that I wanted a better description, but I knew there's something there was something that was I didn't have all of it. I just knew that intuitively. The, this and is it, after the thir after the I, second I, awakening. I was the first of the first one. Oh, after the first one. Okay, I'm sorry. Right, because I think your question was, you know, did did it did it go from the sort of the, the first one being about the formless and the second one being about right. seeing it? Right. Yeah. It was really they were all. It was really the form and the formless all together right from the very beginning. Hmm. Um, but it was wasn't r r real clear at 32. Then that that opening was just extraordinarily crystal clear because at least my thought about it, my experience of it is it had absolutely no emotional overtone at all. Hmm. There was no excitement, no joy, no bodily, no kundalini, no, just literally nothing. And what it allowed me to do is I could see just what was true because mm -hmm. there was no byproduct. You know, later than there was some byproduct, some happiness, some, but at that moment it was so clean and so obvious and so unadorned that um, you know you, I just couldn't miss it. And couldn't did that miss. did that pretty much persist thereafter? Was there any backsliding? Yeah. It didn't persist. It didn't persist with the kind of vividness that 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 comes when you see something for the first time. Hmm. You know, because there's a type of vividness with anything we experience for the first time that's not the same after you've experienced it for right. the hundredth time. You get right? used to it. Right. So there's a, there's a, like an adapting to it, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes it would get very, very subtle. Sometimes it would be more obvious. You know, for a while it kind of 
would go from something so subtle I would wonder if it was gone and then it wasn't when I really looked and something that was so obvious that it was, you know, almost overwhelming. And but that happened for a few years and um I wouldn't say it ever went away. Never went away. But um but then it just sort of all calmed down. Even that sort of waxing, that sort of fluctuation more more or less obvious right just sort of calm down and it just it literally kind of became more into sort of something that's had a normalcy to it in a way mm. i mean it's a, it, there's a beauty to it of course that doesn't go away but you know unity is it's just the way things are isn't it right it's not actually you know it's just the way things are it's the way things always will be everything is unified everything is is actually one so and at a certain point something inside spontaneously just stops making such a big deal out of it <laughs> you know yeah. at first it feels like a big deal because you haven't seen it right yeah, but after a while it's like okay everything's one lovely and that was what 10 15 years ago or something yeah, well, uh, i'm four, 48 now that was when oh, i was, so that was that was like 16 years ago or, or so yeah. Yes. And um, but we spoke earlier about the fact that there there seems to be no end to the refinement uh, or the ability to express or you know embody oh, yeah. that can take place. So how would you characterize this? What's happening with you these days? Like say over the course of the last year, you know, in, in terms of you know what areas are being refined. I don't know if I could just take it in 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 that small of a time frame. Even though I know a year is a pretty big time frame, mm -hmm. but in in general, like I said, what stands out to me from that time on and still more and more is as uh, just of what falls away, of just less and 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 less. Mm -hmm. Really hard to describe what it is. It falls away, and I often only recognize it when um, I'm watch. I'm in a situation where I'm watching other people, and I'm seeing way, the way they're processing what's happening, whether they're talking to each other or their environment or whatever. And I'll just realize, oh yeah, that that stopped happening a couple of years ago. Huh. I, I might not have been conscious of it until that moment. I go, yeah, that stopped happening, and oh, that stopped happening, and. So, you know, those kind of things actually um, are what's still probably most predominant of it's like, what falls away. Like Joni Mitchell said, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. <clears throat> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and the funny thing is the farther it goes, the more it's sort of like, gosh, I don't, I don't even think anybody actually could want, want this. Because there's really isn't, it, it sounds so trite, you know, it sounds so silly uh -huh. in a certain way because these words are often spoken, but it almost looks like there's really nothing here in it to want. Because well, you know, in, they in, might in, not. In the, in the end, it's defined by what's, what's not really, what's not happening anymore. That's, that's, and yes, you know, you could talk about there's an underlying sense of all that energy isn't going into those various forms of conflict, right, both subtle and overt. And that's really nice and that's really pleasant, but the thing that would sit there and say to itself, wow, look what I'm realizing, that thing falls away too. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it's, I think it's, it's sort of very odd that it, it certainly, I don't think, ends up what any of us really had in mind. <laughs> no, because we we can only sort of uh, we can only sort of envision it from whatever state we're in, you know. But I, I'm sure you um, wouldn't trade. You oh know? hell no! Wouldn't trade at all. No, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> Go back yeah. and do it all over again. <laughs> no, no. I'm oversell it. Right. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, and, it does get overselled. I, and it's not just I don't want to oversell it. It's I think there is something that has a truth to it when you realize that, in a strange way, what what one people are truly pulled to, in their, from their real spiritual yearning, it's it's. What you're pulled to towards is something very different than what you're seeking, and that's fine because what you're the, the pull towards towards the, your own reality it utilizes the seeking too. So it's not like they're two separate forces, mm. but the seek a lot of the seeking in it is an anticipation 
right? An anticipation of, oh, the enlightened ones must experience life like this and like this and like this, and I, 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 I want that. I, I, I want to, I want to experience that. Or I read this in a book, and I, and it's interesting how the pull, which I think is a very non-cognitive thing, just the pull mm-hmm. of whatever you want to call of the divine, of truth, of God. The pull is very different than that aspect of the seeking is very different than the seeking aspect of it. Yeah. It, it, it ends up that the pull, it, it eventually kind of pulls you into a reality that was very different than the one that you thought you were seeking. And that's why I think it's worthwhile probing a bit and trying to get you to articulate some of this stuff because it might help people. It might help div- people divest themselves of all sorts of false notions of what it's going to be, and might enable them to realize that they've actually already realized it more than they think they have. You know? Yeah, sometimes people have. And I think one of the things that just came to my mind, Rick, is. Um, that people experience sometimes even way before awakening, and they certainly get into high gear often afterwards, at least when they've come back from their spiritual honeymoon, you know, there, um, is the erosion and the old, and in the end, the disappearance of their personal will. Hmm. That's not something that one can really plan on, and it's hard to imagine it, again, until you kind of look over your shoulder and go, now where did that go? Mm-hmm. It's also the reason as people, as this personal will tends to drain out of their system, which spirituality will, will do. Um, but it also has its dangers. You know, there's lots of spiritual, um, and I don't say this in a derogatory way because that's not what I mean, but it sound, might sound like it, but there's lots of spiritual shipwrecks. Yeah. And a spiritual shipwreck, there are people who have seen enough to have their personal will to a great extent eroded out of your system. Because the will is like, it, it's sort of the base energy which motivates the life of separation. I mean, it literally gets you out of bed, to work, to take care of your kids. To It's this base energy that separation needs to move. Now, if you, you can see through enough of illusion to that personal will energy can be greatly diminished, maybe 90% diminished, but if you haven't seen deeply into the truth, then you're, you're simply less left in a state of separation with almost no personal will. Mm-hmm. And it can be very de- debilitating in all kinds of spiritual communities across all kinds of religions. You find people that can get easily stuck in the place of, um, of very little personal will. You know, or they're caught in a what I call limbo zone between the disappearance of personal will, then you're in a limbo zone where there's really there's no energy motivating you, not only no cognitive but no physical energy, and then eventually there's like there's a different energy that starts to inform the way what moves you and what 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 inspires you in life, and that's something an energy that comes more from the whole, mm-hmm. from 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 the all rather than from the personal. But it's one of the most confusing things that I find that people experience, especially now, everywhere I go, because lots of people have had significant spiritual shifts. Not everybody, but a lot of people have. And they're dealing with, I call the disappearance of your personal will the dirty little secret of spirituality. Because people all over are experiencing it somewhere, and it's like, Nobody's really talking about it because they don't have a language to talk about it, and almost nobody is talking about it. And if they do, if they talk to their 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 doctor or something. The doctor will often say, "Oh, we'll need to put you on some some depression medications. We need to do this to you. You need to you know talk to your family members. Or you just got to get it together." And they don't realize they can't get it together. And yeah. you know, so it's it's a it's one of those things that I find when I talk about, and I'm just doing a very, you know quick introduction but I find people really re- really respond because people do experience that and a lot of what keeps people stuck in these various places is just their basic they have, they have no understanding of it they don't know what's going on so what can people do maybe there's no universal prescription but what can people do to get through that phase and you know ha- have the sort of the larger will get into the driver's seat and motivate their life 
Well, part of it you just said it. The larger will get into the driver's seat, which means you gotta you gotta at some point completely rank, relinquish your seat. Huh. You so can, is that you, what gets you stuck there? That you're not letting go, you're not relinquishing, and and you can yeah. end up doing that for five or ten years, and, and it could oh. only, it, it might be a month instead or a week if you a, really a lot longer than five or ten years. Huh. You can do it almost indefinitely. Yeah. Yeah, because you know you can get it really. There can be even a sort of morbid comfort in it, huh. because you know at least you're not being bothered by all that driven energy anymore. <laughs> and or maybe somebody kind of wanted to be a dropout anyway. Mm. You know, maybe that's part of their conditioning that they which, maybe that's how they're egoically hide. Right? They defend is by kind of dropping out, and so they might get the erosion of the personal will. But to the part that wants to drop out, that can be very alluring can be hard to say, hey, that part that wants to drop out, that's the part you have to let go of. That's mm. the part you have to surrender. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck here, and, you have, and your life's going to fall apart. So, you know, with each person, again, it's very unique to their own circumstance, their own makeup. But in general, I think you really, you, you put a really good generalized, description of what's necessary it's really letting go of one's sort of personal personal relationship to their own existence yeah, I'm kind of reminded of the Gita actually where Arjuna just lost the motivation to, to fight to do anything he just sat down dropped his bow and said you know I'd rather just live on alms than have to do this and in the course of a two hour conversation Krishna got him to the point where the the universal will had taken over and was then motivating him and you know he was established in being performing action rather than just establishing individuality performing action that's it that's it that's the whole Gita right there isn't it yeah. it's, it's, it's dealing with with that issue I mean most of the Gita at least the relationship between Arjuna and Krishna is dealing with that issue and because there is you know the Buddhism they call it right action mm -hmm. it's not a very good word because it goes into people's idea of right and wrong but nonetheless where does action come when it comes from wholeness? And, it's, and it is a selfless action. Sometimes as a human being, you might like it, you might not like it. It might be easy for you, it might demand a lot of you. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a totally different energy. So for, for a certain segment of the people that go through this, simply having an understanding, a container to understand it, sometimes that's all they need. Mm. They just, so their mind can stop telling them that there's something wrong. Yeah. And then and then it's like they're back in this stream and everything just starts to move again. For other people, they have to start to see where they're actually holding on to this sort of desert phase um, because, there can, like I said, there can be a, a part of the subtle remnant of ego that, want, that literally wants to hide there, that wants to stay there, mm. that, that wants to be a dropout. Yeah, I remember one time I was on a course doing a lot of long meditation and then towards the end of the course I went and I was sitting with Maharishi and you know I said, oh, it was so nice just meditating and reading scriptures and, and I'd just like to continue doing this. And he said, if you, he said, if you think that idea has anything to do with enlightenment, you're wrong. He said, you should uh -huh. get out there and do something dynamic and you know just <laughs> get, yeah. basically get off your butt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good. That was really wise. Yeah, wasn't yeah. It? Yeah. yeah, there's an old wise, uh, old uh, Zen master who said, um, "It's not doing nothing; it's doing nothing." Ha uh ha! -huh. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and you know that's 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 it. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a doing of nothing that's different than just dropping out. Yeah. But for temp for for a while, dropping out is might you know if <laughs> most people in this society don't even have that option, but right. you know there's a certain style of that which is something that you know a lot of people are just going to go through it doesn't mean they're going to drop out of life they may they may experience it while they're raising kids and having a family and all that but their relationship with it may may transform and change right mm -hmm. right in the middle of in fact i always think the people that can't, don't have the luxury to drop out of life they're actually lucky yeah in because a way it makes yeah it makes like marishi was saying you know it, it makes it harder for you to get stuck if you've got somebody other than yourself that you've got to be responsible for and answer to. And, you very know, true, very true. It's, it can be really, really useful. 
Have you, um, are we doing okay? Do you, can I ask a few more questions, or are you feeling? I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. Okay, good. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, you told a story about how when your dog died, and uh, you just sobbed uncontrollably, you know, uh, for quite some time, lying on the floor, you know, just really losing it. Oh yeah. And uh, which is probably what we'll do when our dog dies. But um, I. I've gone through a couple of those things. I, one time at my sister's wedding, I just standing up in front of a couple hundred people, I just lost it. And people do that at weddings. But another time I was watching um, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart, and it was the end of the movie where everybody comes in and they start give, putting money in the basket and the angel, the bell rings on the Christmas tree. And I just lost it. I started sobbing. And yeah. I, I sort of got the feeling at the time that just some – calcification of the heart that had taken place yeah. without my even knowing it had just been broken by you know th that catalyst of that scene in the movie and yeah. uh, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit how how we tend to unknowingly unwittingly um, build up a shell um, that c needs to break or uh, either there suddenly or, or suddenly or slowly yeah yeah well there it is we do we do tend to break build up a shell because certain things grief grief is not necessarily a pleasant experience to be having is it no. it doesn't you don't have grief and go wow i feel great <laughs> you know, it's, and, and so i mean that's just that's fairly rudimentary but so there are certain types of experiences that aren't net aren't really what we would think of as positive and so we sort of energetically you know there's a deciding oh i don't want to experience what's not mm. positive and then you, that's, that's simple, but then you throw upon someone's life experience, and then people have been, have these, you know, throughout their whole life from early childhood on, where they've been at, in very open states and, they're, and been in a very lovely, unprotected state, and had some idiot stomp all over it. Mm. You know, especially when they're children, you know, very, there's a vulnerability there, you know, because one can't say no with, any, you know, with a lot of effect and yeah so all there's all these things that happen some are natural some are sort of come out of painful experience but there becomes this calcification this sort of wall walling around of the heart of the, mm. of, and the and of, of the ability to truly to truly feel and one of the problems of that is there is sure in our heart there's this we think of it as emotional center but it's not just an emotional center. The, the heart is literally sort of a sensory organ mm. of spirit, just like your eyes are and your ears are, right? I mean, these are how God sees the world is through those eyes and listens and hears and hears itself and touches itself. And this, this organ of the heart, this is where, this is the organ of perception. This is what perceives oneness. And I don't mean in some flowery spiritual sense. I mean in a very... Just like your eyes perceive form, your ears perceive sound. It's it's the heart that perceives oneness. More so than and the head or the gut. Absolutely. Huh. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This is this. In fact, when people kind of awaken to being, I'm pure awareness, pure formlessness, and nothing else, and they don't get that the whole world around them, that the, the awareness and the world around them is unified. It's actually the same thing. It's usually because they haven't penetrated through the protective barrier of the heart. Huh. So would that you say that that awakening has taken place in the head more or something? That's exactly what I call it. Ah. That's exactly their awakening. I use this as metaphor, but it's also a, has a concreteness to it. There's awakening what I call on the level of mind, mm -hmm. which which is experienced like pure, vast, awake, conscious space. Mm -hmm. Like awakening on the level of mind, which really means identity is freed up from the level of thought, the level of mind. So it has a and it has a particular feeling: vast, clear, empty space. On the heart, the awen on the awakening on the level of heart is an, an, a total, absolute intimacy with all things. Mm -hmm. So all things are experienced to be as close as your skin. They are your own skin. You know, not as a concept or an idea, but from an experiential point of view, this extraordinary intimacy with all form. That's that's the level of heart. And of course on the level of gut we talked about earlier the what I call our most existential sense of self, which is just the 
this like a, just a grasping mm. right in the gut. If you ever notice when t someone starts to tell you how about their fear, if they start to talk to you, nine out of ten times unconsciously they'll put their hand on their gut because that's also the seat of fear because the seat of self is this is irrational clench, this, ira ir this irrational no to existence. Yeah. Right? It's constriction. Right, so awakening there and that level is that's when you really awaken from to awaken from self is really to awaken from that constriction. That huh. constriction is no longer there. I realize that perhaps these don't have to strictly take place sequentially, but it sounds no. the way you present it like they tend to anyway, head, heart, gut. And so that would imply that one could have that vastness of awareness and yet, you know, there's still that shell around the heart, as you were just saying. Uh, or one could, ha one could have head and, and heart opened and, and being sort of appreciating the oneness of everything, and yet there's still a resistance to what is, still a, a sort of an ego trying to run the show. Yeah, 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 there still can be that, that, that self. And people experience these different levels oftentimes sort of competing with each other. Hmm. When some, like I hear this all the time, and I imagine other spiritual teachers do too, they say, I know this isn't true, but, <laughs> you know, they have a thought. I know this isn't true. I know I've seen through it. And they, and they may know from a really true place of knowing, right? Not just intellectual, but they really know, but. And when they say but, it means the next thing they're going to say is going to tell me where, what, what, what part of themselves isn't clear yet. Hmm. I, 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 but, but I just, I keep, I keep saying it. Yeah, okay, where is the saying ever come from? And then maybe you can start to sense it's actually in the heart or in the gut. So this can be sequential. Oftentimes, sometimes at someone's first awakening, you can the whole thing, all of it, will just burst open. But then there's usually kind of a bungee cord effect. <laughs> so maybe the whole thing, right, woke up, but then it's like what becomes obvious to you is maybe a month later is awakened mind. Hmm. I'm pure, formless, space-like consciousness, self-luminous consciousness. And these other two may have gotten, you may, you know, they may have sort of closed down or something. Hmm. So it, or someone can skip one and go to the other. So it's, it's one, again, a paradox where it's not sequential necessarily, because you can go, it can bounce all over the place, but in the big scheme of things, there's a sequential nature to it at the same huh. time. It yeah. is and it isn't, huh. you know. <clears throat> Interesting. Well, I, I love the nuanced nature of the way you speak, you know, because for so many teachers it sounds so black and white on and off you know hot and cold and and you kind of you give it a sort of a, a complexity which is not over adorned it's not confusing but it, I think it it speaks more to the actual reality of the situation uh, and really does uh, justice to what people are going through because you know generally speaking I think it, it, there is going to be you know no two people having it the same way and, and a great deal of of a variety yeah 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 and, and in the end the only thing that's relevant is you know what's what what works yeah yeah what's working is it working is it actually working for you you know and not not being um and not uh, um not fooling yourself you know not lying to yourself about you know uh, whether whether something's working if it's working great yeah very important. There's a Tibetan proverb that I came re across a while back that I've been beating to death in these interviews, and maybe I'll put it to rest after running it by you, but it's, uh, uh, don't mistake understanding for awakening, for, for realization. Don't mistake understanding for realization. Don't mistake realization for liberation. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I would go, I would go right along with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because it, it does. There, it, it does go. It it does go beyond even um, realization in the form of insight or whatever. There is there is there is a, there's a deeper realm than than yeah. Than and I mean, and the first kind of insight. Yeah, and the first part of it. I mean, a lot of people will go to a few thought songs, read a few books, 
and and you you do get a genuine intuitive understanding of this because it's right there in your blood but mm -hmm. i think very often people mistake that for the the full enchilada yeah yeah <laughs> You know, one can always check. You know, we can, we, we can walk around thinking, okay, I'm totally awake and I'm totally liberal. There's, uh, there's, there's one proof of the pudding. Mm -hmm. are, are you still in conflict? Yeah. Do you, as Ram, do you, as, go ahead, I'm do sorry. You do you experience emotional and psychological conflict? If you do, that doesn't mean you've got to, you know, throw out everything you think you realize, but it means um, there might be more to see, mm. you know? Because that's that's the liberation part. The liberation is the the the, the disappearance of yeah. conflict. As that's I or as I like to say, no more argument with yourself. No argument, more argument with God. No more argument with the world, and no ar more argument with death. Sounds good. When all the arguments are gone, okay. Now now we're now we're talking about something significant. As Ramdas put it, if you think you're enlightened, go spend a week with your parents. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's probably the best one I've heard of. I've heard that before. I love that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, they you, have could the, you could also say your children or your mother-in-law or whatever. Absolutely. Go home for yeah. Go home for the holidays. Or, and then they have they have a saying that's somewhat like that. If you want to know how enlightened the master is, um, ask his wife. <laughs> Very good. Or her husband, as the yeah. case may be. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, a, that's, a, that's, that's the one thing I got out of this, one of the really good things I got out of the Zen tradition is Zen, it's focused on insight and it's focused on realization, but it's, mo it's even more focused on can you express it? Mm. Can you put it into action? That's, that's I think, what it, as a tradition, what Zen holds. You know, different traditions hold different things, and Zen really holds, can you, gr can you, can you put this into action? Okay, I'm awakened. Show me. Yeah. Show me in a way that's not intellectual, and you know, don't tell me your consciousness and all that kind of stuff. Show me. Yeah. And there's, the there's a part of that that I've always really expect, I've really respected, and really was happy that was part of my own a path, I guess you'd say. I like that. If I could impose upon you a few more minutes, um, there's some questions people submitted when they knew I, I was going to interview you, and maybe we, if we could take another five, ten minutes, would that be sure. all right? Or, yeah, mm -hmm. You're not running out of steam there? Oh. Okay. Um, here's one. Uh, some guy said, since the beginning of the year, your live sessions seem to have a greater urgency. Is this a conscious ramping up, or has it happened naturally? Wow. Or are you even That's aware that it's happened? Well, I, my mind just went to the. I can just tell you where my mind went. I, I don't know if I've had a, a if I've personally felt a, a sense of greater urgency. You know, I don't, I don't really feel that inside. But I certainly did um, in this year start to talk about things that I didn't form that I really didn't talk about in the past much. Um, you know, things like real experience of no self. Um, and some other things which I tried to talk about 10 years ago and everybody was wrapped up so much in we're all we're all awakened that nobody wanted to hear it uh -huh. and yeah and I used to literally say to a couple people who were close to me I, I would say I wonder what's going to happen when the other shoe drops <laughs> which means there's more to this than they now imagine and uh, and then now they are now uh -huh. people you know they're now they're they're people where where I you know wherever I go, their their own depth of their own experience, their own realization, is 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 maturing as it does. And so now I started to talk about some of these things, and that are much more challenging. You might say that maybe where why he feels a sense of urgency because they're just more challenging by nature. Hmm. Um, and yet I have found that wow, it was interesting because I found that actually that's the stuff people want me to talk about yeah yeah they didn't want me to 10 years ago and now I get I get by far the most um, letters and and emails um, that are positive when I talk about sometimes the most mm. difficult and challenging things so that's that's really that sh that shows that people are maturing in their own spirituality and they're they're they want something deeper they they want something mm. beyond just don't struggle and stop and you know they, they've done that and yeah they want and 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 i think that's actually quite beautiful so maybe that's what he's he sensed 
it's interesting that the whole collective is kind of evolving together in a way you know you're you're seeing this wherever you go yeah yeah Yeah. it is it's really interesting kind of exciting yeah it is it's it's actually quite beautiful yeah Uh, um here's another one and maybe this will be the last one um adya you have mentioned that awakening is a major shift in identity and also that several people who have undergone this awakening have asked how to reverse it. (laughs) From what you have said, it sounds as if the initial experience is strange and perhaps lonely. Could you discuss this, how awakening progresses? We've kind of done this in this interview, but maybe you could just touch about how how awakening progresses and if these people eventually find being awakened a better and more enjoyable state than being unawakened. In the long run, I've never had somebody come back and say, gee, I really wish that didn't happen. Mm. You know, I have had people usually in in the midst of something that's in the midst of something happens that some remnant of ego goes, whoa, gets really frightened, you know, because it's sensing that it's it's losing its, it's, that it's no longer going to be the center of their, of what drives their life. And it's very, can be very, very frightening Mm. for an ego. And also there's a phase that many people go through that where you really experience your own aloneness Mm -hmm. and that's some people get like an intuitive glimpse of that before some real spiritual shift some people don't but they're certainly going to get a real deeper experience of that after a real shift a lot of people have really experienced a deep aloneness which for some people will trigger given their conditioning will trigger memories and feelings of of loneliness Hmm. you see and so they'll have to see through their because loneliness and aloneness are very different aloneness in its deepest sense is all one it's all one and it's all alone because there isn't there isn't a but there isn't something else out there Um, but even getting near that recognition can often does trigger people's um, experiences of loneliness and the, the pain and the isolation of it and they're afraid that it might end up in that same kind of isolation or pain hmm. um, so I, I really cued into that word when he yeah you know, well usually that. alone loneliness or aloneness means you know this little me is isolated from everything else but the real right. aloneness that you're referring to the, the Sanskrit word is kaivalya is that you're the only thing that that is so really that's you're, right you're in good company <laughs> that's right that's right yeah there's if there's no, the only no. thing that is then loneliness you have there has to be two to be lonely right you can't there can't be really loneliness when there's one mm. you know? but when you kind of put your foot in one the one can feel very lonely when it's being interpreted by yeah. By your own separateness. When, you, when, then, you, when you're not all the way there, really. Yeah, especially if you've had a life where you've experienced a lot of loneliness. Mm. I exchanged mm. emails with someone who had been watching some of the shows, and she said she had this had had this enlightenment experience, and that it was so bland and flat and blah, and you know, it wasn't what she had hoped or expected. And I said, well, I said, don't necessarily assume that that's the f- you know the fully blossomed matured state that you may eventually you know develop into just mm-hmm. you know take that as a glimpse and don't get discouraged yeah yeah don't get discouraged mm-hmm. keep going yeah just keep keep not keep going in the sense of keep grasping but like don't worry talk you know get back to me in a year or two <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> it will uh, not be exactly it will not seem like it seems now you know sometimes that's all you can say to somebody which actually is a is a is a statement of great tra- great trust because this does there is a I know this isn't sort of the right correct non dual language that people like like to use but there is a there is a process to all this mm. especially the process that unfolds after you've had a real a real glimpse it it it, it gets deeper and it matures and it uh, and that usually isn't something that happens in the twinkle of an eye you know. Well, maybe it's time for the correct non-dual language to sort of be phased out. <laughs> In fact, some of the non-dual teachers who were really adamant about speaking that way a few years ago are saying, wait a minute, you know, I'm changing my tune here, and, and they're they're yeah. developing into more of the kind of way you, you put things. Well, you know, also what, let me just end on this, um, is what I've really seen is over the, over the years is 
there's a great value in something just its newness. Yeah. When it's new, it's extraordinarily powerful. I mean, when Maharishi came and brought TM yoga, mm-hmm. and man, it was nobody was doing meditation. Nobody was doing. The and Beatles it, did it, and it, it, it exploded, you know? Right, and so it was new, and because people didn't have a category to put it in their mind, it had a very deep impact, right? It actually, right. It, something doesn't grow that big because it has no effect on people. Uh, like right. Things grow big because actually something does happen for them. Yeah. But the problem is once our mind has got used to language and a certain teaching and it's it's got into its habitual pattern, then this exact same thing, it doesn't have newness. And that becomes problematic because it's newness that breaks through the mind. Hmm. It's when your mind isn't you, it doesn't have a category to put it in. It's like it gets caught by surprise. Yeah. When it's, when it's no longer caught by surprise, it just gathers. Oh, yes, there's nothing to do. There's nobody to do. With. It's all one. That's, you know, and those same teachings 10 years ago, great impact. Right. There was nowhere to put it inside of the spiritual conditioning. Now, you know, <laughs> there's sh- shelves full of where you put that kind of, you know. Not that yeah. the teaching's bad. It's just that, you know, like anything, it gets too familiar and we tend to start to kind of go to sleep a little bit. Mm. Which is, we've come full circle because that's how we started this interview. I was talking about how I enjoy listening to you so much because it, it almost seems like it's ever fresh and there's... You know, you're not just saying the same thing over and over again. So it'll be interesting to see how you continue to do it. You know, over the days, weeks, months, years, um, I'll be fascinated to continue to listen and watch. And uh, maybe my like, next year, you'll be going, "Good Lord, Audrey, can you change what you?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let you know if that happens. <laughs> okay. But so far, I haven't had that problem. <laughs> I don't think I'll, I'd be the first one to know because I have very short patience for uh, sounding the same. Yeah. So I, I really want to thank you again for, for doing this interview. It's, it's been really enjoyable for me, something I've been looking forward to for a long time. Um, I'm, I, I would like to apologize to our viewers if, if the video you, you've been watching is anything like what I've been seeing on my s- screen where Adya looks alternately like a space alien and a burn victim because we're getting so <laughs> such poor quality. That I really apologize for that. There's, we tried to fix it. There was not much we could do to, to get it any better. But hopefully you, you've you know the audio is good and and that's what really counts <laughs> <laughs> well i appreciate you giving it a good try you know there's only so much you can do with a face like this so. <laughs> <laughs> oh your face is okay <laughs> so it's great to talk to you rick it oh it's really you. great yeah I, I, I was looking forward to it oh thank you and uh, i look forward to you know meeting you again in person maybe some retreat or some get you back to the boondocks of iowa or something or other because uh, it's always a joy <clears throat> So uh, just to conclude, um, you've been watching uh, an episode of an ongoing interview series, which we call Buddha at the Gas Pump. Um, the website where you can find all of them archived is batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P. And there you can sign up for an uh, email newsletter thing if you want to be notified each time a new interview gets posted. There are discussion groups which spring up around each interview. Um, various things like that. So go there if you'd like to learn more. You can sign up for a podcast also if you'd like to listen to this sort of thing while you're commuting to work. So batgap.com. Thanks again to Adya Shanti. Next interview, unless something gets screwed up, should be Joan Tollefson. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>